I am Andrus Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. Today, uh, it, we're having another meeting of our Math for Wisdom study group for the mathematics of the divisions of everything and with a special focus on complex numbers. It's the second uh, part of a presentation by John Harland on the complex numbers. And um, so I just want to welcome John uh, right now. Um, we enjoyed his talk last time. And then um, first I'll give a preliminary remarks about 10 or 15 minutes uh, about how the complex numbers fit in number systems in general and how those are all uh, relevant uh, for wondrous wisdom, for this language of cognitive frameworks, uh, which is the whole point of math for wisdom. Um, this is the ABCs of wondrous wisdom. These are the things that uh, we keep trying to return to because um, if this is real, then maybe everything else is possibly real. And so this is simply saying that um, we encounter in the our experience of life uh, these limits on our imagination uh, that sometimes we have um, two points of view available, uh, like in matters of existence, such as opposites coexist, all is the same. Sometimes yeah, three points of view, as with this learning cycle of taking a stand, following through and reflecting. Sometimes four points of view, uh, these four levels of knowledge, whether, what, how, why. And so I want to talk about complex numbers and uh, other numbers, uh, how they may manifest this, um, which would give potentially some evidence uh, for this and allow us also to modify that, so uh, to uh, model that. So here's a slide, it said complex numbers uh, and the twosome. And so the idea is that complex numbers are two dimensional. And uh, one of the dimensions is given by the number one, the real numbers as we're used to. The other one is given by the pure imaginary numbers. So you could multiply that by I. And then uh, realizing that I comes along with negative I, and actually, uh, or we could call it the conjugate of I, it would be I bar. And actually, you could call that J, and then I would be negative J. So it's like identical twins, and they're real opposites, and there's really not one distinguished uh, uh, over the other. There's no way to tell them apart. Uh, it's just uh, it's a convention how you choose to name them. So in particular, for example, I squared is negative 1, and I bar squared is also negative 1. Whereas with one, it is just one, and uh, one and minus one are not the same thing. So uh, one squares to itself, that would be one, but minus one squares to plus one, which is different than minus one. So you can tell them apart. Uh, so this is, uh, this is one place where this uh, may be coming up. It may mean something. The quaternions would be so, so another. Andrew, um, can I can I yes? interrupt a second? Negative. Please. So I bar, uh, I conjugate, which is negative I, also squares to negative one. Um, so, yes. So why is that not the same relationship I to I I conjugate to? Why is that not in that sense the same relationship? as one to negative one, because they both square to the same thing. Well, one squares to positive one, right? Yeah. So I and I bar square to the same thing. They're indistinguishable. There's no way to tell apart I and I bar. It's just, you know, if you named I bar J, right? You couldn't, you know, they would, the I would be J bar. Okay. So there's no way to tell them apart. Whereas with one and negative one, you can tell them apart. Um, one squares to itself, which is one. Negative oh, one squares oh, gotcha. to right, right. Okay. one, I, I which mean. is not negative one. And right. so that's a subtle thing, you know, and people wouldn't worry about these things. But I'm just saying, because this is such an important, um, so this is the kind of thing we're looking for, right? Like that I and I bar are demonstrating that opposites can coexist. And these are opposites in the truest sense. They're like identical twins. But one and minus one aren't really um, opposites in that way. One is somehow maybe more fundamental than minus one. This is something to think about, but this is okay. uh, what we're looking for is uh, where does this come up in math? Now, with the quaternions, there's a couple ways to think about them. But one of them, um, and the quaternions are a four-dimensional number system. 
And one of the ways to think about them is that they're two sets of complex numbers. And so um, you could um, you could take one set and multiply it by i, let's say, and then you'd have the other set. And I won't go through all the details, but one way to think of it, though, is that uh, you could have, let's say, k and j, and those are um, those are numbers um, where k is i times j. And then you maybe would extract the the um, the i out and say, hey, instead of k and j, that's really deeper inside is i and one. You know, we can divide out by j. Let's say we'll be left with i and one. So then you get these four types of dimensions. You get maybe two of these uh, two sums. Let's say put together. So that's one way to think of the quaternions. Are they coding this up? Who's to say? But um, but that's something to keep in mind. Uh, there's another way to code up the quaternions, um, that um, those four dimensions, uh, three of them form a three cycle. So um, now the learning cycle is taking a stand, following through, reflecting. You go back to taking a stand. It's kind of interesting that uh, there's this three cycle in this number system. It says if you have i and j and you multiply them together, you'll get k. But if you multiply j and k together, following these arrows, you'll get i. And if you follow the arrows and you go k times i, you'll get j. So they form like a three cycle. But it's very it's a non-commutative. That means that the arrows, the direction of the arrows is important. If you go in the opposite direction, you'll get minus k mm -hmm. when you multiply j times i. You'll get uh, minus i when you multiply k times j, and you'll get minus j when you multiply i times k. So it's saying that this is very directional. Uh, and that's the quaternions, and that's the threesome. So um, now here you're not looking at the um, additional fourth dimension, which would be the number one, let's say the real numbers. So um, this is uh, just something to think about. And maybe just to say um, the quaternions, uh, we use this letter H to define them, and that's uh, in honor of Hamilton, who invented them. Uh, uh, because the letter Q uh, is taken by the rational numbers. Uh, that's something that's probably from Latin. It's assigned to the rational numbers. So the real numbers, the complex numbers, the quaternions are really uh, basic number systems um, that appear a lot. And in a certain sense, the most basic number system is the complex numbers. The real numbers are like half of the complex numbers. The complex numbers are two dimensionals. The real numbers are one dimensional. The quaternions are like a double complex number. They're four-dimensional. And what's interesting, first of all, is that there's really no three-dimensional number system that would have nice properties uh, related to the reals. And so you can ask, well, what kind of number systems are possible and which ones are you know, consistent, coherent, and which ones are nice? And so as uh, John talked about last time, um, you can invent number systems that in the end turn out to be just not making any sense. Like if you know, if you try to add a number one over zero, you're just gonna run into problems. You're gonna, you're gonna get inconsistencies and the whole thing will become degenerate or trivial uh, and not interesting. So, but these are all interesting. And now how could you create more? It turns out if you try to create more, um, like I said, there's no three dimensional system. The natural ways to do it is that you double the dimensions. But once you get past four dimensions, you get, let's say, eight dimensions. You kind of have to choose how are you going to do that. And you get uh, two different choices, and they're both problematic. So one way of constructing numbers is called the Cayley-Dixon construction. You use ordered pairs. So And, and John basically talked about this. Uh, like You start with, let's say, the real numbers, and you say, OK, I want to have pairs of, complex, of real numbers. That'll be complex numbers. So A and B which you could think of as like A plus B I and C comma D, you could think of that as C plus D I. And you would have this type of multiplication rule uh, where the star is uh, the conjugate. That's uh, that would involve, um, I think, a minus sign. So um, or you would define this conjugate. So you, you make this. It turns out that this construction is very fruitful and you'll get what are called division algebras. So. You can take pairs of real numbers and define them to be complex numbers. 
then you could take a pair of complex numbers and say, well, that'll be the quaternions. You can get a pair of quaternions and that'll be the octonians. You can get a pair of octonians and that'll be the sedenonians. Um, and then um, you can do that. But And there will all be division algebras. There'll be norm division algebras. So they'll all have a sense of a, a metric, a measure, a distance. And there'll also be division algebras, which is important in the sense that uh, and I'll discuss that. I'll discuss that in the next slide. But you get these problems. So the complex numbers, they're like the real numbers, but they you lose the total order. Because uh, total order, you need things to be one dimensional. OK, you lose that. But once you get to the quaternions, you lose commutativity. So if you remember the last slide, i times j will give you k. But if you switch it around, j times i is minus k, which is not the same as k. So that means that you have to keep track of i times j and j times i. You're going to get different answers. Uh, so you have to keep track of that. It's not commutative. And then we'll see, on, I'll give you a slide, like the Ectonians are not associative, which means that you have to really worry about parentheses too. So this is one way to build your number systems. And this is uh, on the right hand side is another way. Another So on the, on the left hand side, we do it by having ordered pairs. On the right hand side, we do it by having generators. And that's called Clifford algebras. So you can keep adding generators. With the complex numbers, you can add a generator, which would be, let's say, e sub i, or uh, and the square root of e sub, I mean, the square of e sub i would be minus one. So, but uh, we're more used, you know, in complex, you'd say one comma i, i would be the generator. But then uh, that would be if you had a single generator, it'd be two dimensionals. But if you had two generators, it would become four dimensional. So um, two generators could be like i and j, uh, and those would all square to negative one. But then you could also multiply them together, like i times j. Well, we saw in the last slide, i times j would be k. So e1, e2 would be k, so that'd be i, j, k. And then there's this one, it'd be four dimensional. And now if you had three of the generators and they all square to negative one, then you could have, um, you'd have eight dimensions because you'd have the pairs and you'd also have the whole thing. And so it keeps doubling like that. Uh, and so that's, uh, you can go, um, it's kind of actually kind of simple in a certain sense. It's not so complicated as that formula. Uh, it's kind of simple, but um, you lose some nice properties. Uh, it is no longer a division algebra. Uh, you'll get what's called the split by quaternion, quaternions and stuff. So we'll explain that. Um, but just to notice here, when you have these generators, it's very much like uh, evolving like the binomial theorem, where you're choosing um, whether or not to include the generator. Like if you have two generators, you can include them both, or you can have neither. If you have three generators, you could have one of them in three different ways. You could have pairs of them in three different ways, or you could have all three or you could have none of them. So, and then uh, this, where you choose them all, if you remember the video I made about the binomial theorem, the portal to your mind, choosing all and choosing none, are it's not symmetric, but it's almost symmetric. So choosing all of them yields what's called a pseudo-scalar. And so it can function almost like one, and it becomes very different, like you ask questions like, well, if you square this, will it be negative one or one? If you square this, will it be negative one or one? Will this commute with all these other generators or not? You know, you can ask that type of questions. It'll become important for bot periodicity. So just- uh, yeah, That's a nice slide, on. Andrew. Thank you for that slide. It's really, really uh, well thought out. I, you know, it summarizes a oh, lot good. of stuff. Yeah, and so I'll try to explain. And this, some of these concepts, you know, John, what the slide kind of shows you is that complex numbers are in the sweet spot. Um, reals are like half of the complex numbers. Quaternions are like double. Complex number reals are kind of like two plane. Complex numbers have a little bit of funkiness because of this generator. But if you have too many generators, it becomes a little bit degenerate in the following ways. So like H plus H, um, the direct sum H plus H. It's kind of like two copies of the quaternions. So you would have a quaternion on the left uh, and a quaternion on the right. This is not a division algebra. And what does that mean? It means that you can have um, something non-zero, like this one, and something non-zero here. 
And when you multiply them together, well, the way you multiply them is that the left one times the left one and the right one times the right one, and you'll get zero, zero, which is zero for, the, for this. So you're getting two non-zero things multiplying to get to zero. That causes problems um, when you're trying to deal with division. And I, I can't even maybe say what those problems are. Another example would be like a 12-hour clock. If you have a 12-hour clock, like we do, uh, 12 is like zero. And so you get in this situation where 6 o'clock times 2, that'd be 6 plus 6 is 12, that would be zero. So 6 times 2 is zero. And that works problematically. Um, whereas if you had a prime number, like um, a 7-hour clock, a 7-hour clock, you'll never run into that problem because nothing times nothing is going to be giving you 7. So um, you're not going to have that uh, uh, problem. So this is a, not a division algebra. And if you want things to be division algebras, um, these higher order Clifford algebras are not going to satisfy you. Now, on the other hand, these Octonians, they have this beautiful uh, multiplication system. Now, of course, this is more complicated than the one I showed you for the Quaternions. Uh, and it, it works a little bit like this. Like if you have E1 times E2 times E3, you find them on this chart. So E1 is here. And E2, you go on the circle. And, okay, so E1, let's go E2 times E3. That's the first one. If I start from E2 and I go to E3, that's on the line with E5. So you can imagine if I kept going, E2 times E3 would be E5. Okay, E1 times E5. If I have E1 times E5, I start here, I go to E5. That's on the same line as E6. And so I go around and I get E6. So multiplying this thing, but using these parentheses where I, I did the E2, E3 first, I'm going to get E6. But you see the problem, and this is why it's not associative. If I use these parentheses here, then um, I'd start with E1 times E2. E1 times E2 is going to get me E4, according to this picture, the way it works. But E4 times E3... E4, E3 is behind it, you see? So that's going to get me E6, but it's going to count negative. It will be a negative E6. So E6, the one way, negative E6, the other way, they're not equal. That means this is not associative. This diagram, but see, not associative for our purposes, for, for my purposes, for wondrous wisdom, not necessarily a problem. Uh, associativity means, you know, that the parentheses don't matter. But, but for example, maybe they should matter, uh, like if we're modeling perspectives. So let's say there's John perspectives of Kirby's perspective of Bill's perspective. Well, Kirby looking at Bill and then John seeing that from the side, let's say, John is seeing how Kirby looks at Bill. That would be one thing. But we see like, John's looking at Kirby, like the way that John understands Kirby, and then applying that to Bill, you know, John's understanding of Kirby applying to that Bill, that may give a different result. That's not necessarily the same thing, or it may or may not be, but so that depends on how you model this. So this is one way, but this diagram, basically something like this does come up in Wondrous Wisdom. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something to be aware of. Um, another example, just for associativity, like, when you add numbers like three plus four plus five, that's always associative, and you don't. It doesn't matter how you combine them, but uh, it's also commutative. But if you have subtraction like three minus four minus five, you have to be very careful to put in parentheses because four minus five would be negative one, three minus negative one would be four, whereas like three minus four would be negative one, negative one minus five would be negative six. So. They're not going to match up. Subtraction is going to have big problems. So it's not associative. So and this is concluding my whole remarks uh, to say that, uh, well, um, the Clifford algebras, the beauty of them is for, um, and this is a version of what I call BOP periodicity. You can see how the Clifford grow in the one direction. You can add generators like we have been uh, with that square to negative one. So you get the complexes, you get the... Uh, quaternions, you get sums of quaternions, and then you get two by two matrices of quaternions. 
Now you can go in the opposite direction. You can have different generators, which square to one, positive one. In that case, instead of complexes with imaginary numbers, you would just have two copies of the reals. And then you could have two by two matrices of the reals. And then you could have uh, two by two matrices of the complexes. And you could have two by two matrices of the quaternions. You end up in the same spot. And it turns out there's something here um, that's much more general where like if you go eight around, like so if we kept on adding these e to the i's and we went all the way around, we would get something that's basically like the real numbers. Or if you kept going around this way, you would get basically something like the real numbers. Uh, so that is very curious. And it's not clear, like I was showing, it's not clear how the divisions of everything would map on to these structures, but it is possible that they could map on to the crevices in between them somehow. That maybe there's crevices in here that somehow carry that information. That's why I'm trying to really master this. And so in conclusion, uh, I've shown you this before. These are the eight divisions of everything they make for this uh, bot periodicity. That's what I'm trying to work on. So this was all just context uh, for um, for um, John's talk, just to say, like, when we think about the complex numbers, he'll be giving us lots of uh, applications, and uh, including physical thinking, his experience as a mathematician. But how could this fit in a broader philosophical framework? That's what I want to present. So maybe we'll have more discussion. Was this interesting, at least? <laughs> I don't know. But... Uh, I can't hear you, John, no. I'll circle back to it a little bit while I'm talking. Yeah. Let me just uh, do a quick review, quick uh, pass through for where we've been here. Remind you of what we did in July. I think it was July. Um, yeah, July, July uh, 24th. Um, so what a complex number. So this is more or less from a, a historical point of view. Um, can everybody hear me? Am I good? Yes. Okay. And, um, but then, you know, some modern applications of complex numbers toward the end. Um, but, you know, of course, complex numbers, you know, the, in the most naive sense, or you just take the real numbers and you screw, you throw in the square root of negative one, you call that I. Oops. What happened there? Um, so we call that i, the square root of negative one, number that squares to negative one. And of course, it's not a real number because there's no real number that can square to negative one. So, um, so Descartes uh, decided that he liked this number and he wanted to call it something. So he called the, imag the imaginary unit and the set of numbers that results uh, that are multiples of the imaginary unit or imaginary numbers. Their imaginary numbers have a square that is negative. So for example, the square root of negative four is two times i. Why is that? Because when you square two times i using the laws of exponents, you get negative four. And um, so, you know, why are these interesting? You know, why, they, why do they arise? Well, one place that they did arise was like in the quadratic formula, which is a great formula for solving quadratic equations like that and this formula right here it's a great formula but the problem is is that sometimes it results in nonsense when b squared minus 4ac is less than zero you get a square root of a negative number and um so what does that mean you know when you, when you have a square root of a negative number well in a in a very naive sense it means that you don't have any solutions it means that there is no x that will satisfy this equation on the other hand if you're like descartes and adventurous and you decide that you want to include square roots of negative numbers in your family of numbers then then what it means is that uh you've got solutions of your quadratic equation but they're just not real they're they're uh something else and so the entire number system that we're working with when we talk about square roots of negative numbers is the complex number system. We take imaginary numbers, which are square roots of negative numbers. We merge them with real numbers. 
and we get the complex number system. So you get no matter what, this, the quadratic equation is going to arise in two complex roots. They may be real if they don't have square roots of negative numbers, but if they do have square roots of negative numbers, they're going to be complex. So there's a certain nice symmetry to that, you know, that uh, a second degree quadratic equation here has two solutions always if you allow for imaginary numbers. So that may be a, uh, you know, mathematically satisfying, but what does it really mean, you know, and why would you care about it? So we did a, we, we did an application where you're trying to enclose a certain area with a certain amount of fencing and whether it can be done by making the right size rectangle. And we decided that for 2000 square feet, if you have 200 feet of fencing, you can definitely do it. And there's a couple of different solutions. They're actually symmetric solutions. Uh, length and width are going to be that. But if you try to enclose 3,000 square feet uh, and you go ahead and write out the equation that the, the model's at, you're going to end up with uh, two complex solutions. And what is the interpretation of that? It means you can't do it. So all this, all the complex number was doing there, all the imaginary, you know, the imaginary, you know, square root of, of a negative number is doing is signaling to us that we cannot solve this problem. So basically, in this, in the context of this problem, the complex number system is rather frivolous in, in the sense that you don't need that number system. All it, all you need to know is that you, you're taking the square root of a negative number, and that tells you that there is no solution. There's no way to enclose in a rectangular enclosure an area of 3,000 square feet using a fencing of 200 feet. It's just not long enough. You can't do it. So for centuries, maybe millennia, this is the way that mathematicians thought of the square roots of negative numbers. They mean that there is no solution. And, but someone named Cardano, actually three people in 1545 came up with a cubic formula, a, a, form, a formula for the solutions of cubic equations, which are like quadratic, only they involve third powers of the variable. And it's now called Cardano's formula, but these are the mathematicians that it's ascribed to. These were all competing, I think, mathematicians in the same town in Italy. They were all kind of working on the same thing. Maybe not the same town, but you know, I think they knew of each other and they were working on the same thing. We now attribute the, car the formula to Cardano, but I think it's just a convenience. Um, and here's what it looks like. First of all, you can always reduce a cubic equation to this form by, mean, by just tricky means of substitution. Uh, so there's nothing profound going on when you eliminate the square term of a, you can always eliminate the square term of a cubic equation by means of substitution. And so if you've got an, uh, an equation of this form, uh, the solutions are going to look like this, way more complicated than the quadratic formula. But nevertheless, something you could just plug in and mechanically uh, hash out the solutions. And this was a new formula that no one had ever seen before. In fact, I was reading somewhere that this had a big effect on mathematics. Uh, it doesn't seem like such a big event. It's just a formula, but it was something that was new in mathematics that had not been discovered by the Greeks or Romans or anything in Hellen Hellenistic times. And I think there was a belief before this that everything that was really significant had already been discovered in mathematics. And so this led to a huge interest in creating new mathematics. Uh, so it's more than just sort of a picky unish formula where you crank and grind. It really kind of was inspiration for a lot of new mathematics that followed it. And, and so here's an application. Suppose you want to build a rectangular box with a certain, uh, enclosing a certain volume with a certain square area, a certain, a certain, uh, a certain amount of uh, glass or sheet metal or whatever. Can you do it? 
And so you write out the equations and you end up getting this cubic equation that, that models the situation. You say, is there a solution to that cubic? Plug it into Cardano's formula and crank and grind. And what do you know? You get two solutions. You get two possible shapes of three-dimensional boxes that have the correct uh, that have the correct uh, surface area and have the correct volume. So, very useful, very useful formula. On the other hand, notice what happened when we tried to compute using Cardano's formula. We got imaginary numbers. We got or complex numbers in the computations themselves. In other words, even though the roots are real, we had to use complex numbers in the process of coming up with these real roots. By the way, we got a nonsense solution too. The negative solution uh, gives us tells us we can't, you know, you can't have a, you know, x, you know, that which tells you how large the base is. You can't have that negative. So uh, we throw that one out, but that's not so troubling. It just means that our our formula here has a model breakdown. It 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 models the correct situation and also models a. Uh, physically unrealizable situation. We're used to that in math mathematical modeling. Um, so, but it's curious, these two real solutions, we had to use complex numbers in order to get them. And that kind of freaked people out. They, they thought we could forever ignore complex numbers. They have no meaning, but they have some kind of intermediate meaning in, in this computation. So, that led to an interest in this whole enterprise of complex numbers. And, um, you know, because- Plus you have to be able to, you have to be able to get the cube root of a complex number, right? I mean, that's that's, that's right. a rather sophisticated right. thing. Yeah, no, I'm- You have, I'm so you have to really have a good grasp, like what does that mean, right? Yeah, the cube root of a complex number, you have to visualize it in the complex plane. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a complex number that has the same, well, it's got a, it's it's got an angle uh, away from the x-axis. It's one third the original angle. So, like you have to, yeah, you have to interpret. You have to do a lot of manipulation with complex numbers in order to get this. So it's almost like, oh, the complex number system is there, underpinning everything, even though we've been ignoring it for all these millennia. Okay. So we could not ignore complex numbers anymore. Starting with this new mathematics. And um, so now there's a question, you know, when you throw when you throw the square root of negative one into your number system, does it goof it up? You know, because you can throw stuff into your number system. We talked about this last time, one over zero, if you try to make sense of that as a number, it just, it completely messes up your number system. Um, in other words, you get an inconsistent number system where one is equal to zero, you can prove that one is equal to zero, and five is equal to six and so forth. So there's, you can't just throw anything you want into a number system. Um, and so what's the assurance that by throwing in the square root of negative one, that we have a consistent number system? And the, the answer is you really don't develop the complex numbers that way. Um, one formal way of developing the complex numbers is you take all ordered pairs of real numbers, and then you define this very straightforward addition where you just add across. Well, what happened there? So it's much like Andres was just doing, you know, you you define a, a new kind of arithmetic where you you add order pairs this way and you multiply them this kind of crazy way. Um, why does why are you multiplying that crazy way? Well, that comes from the distributive property of if you write out your complex numbers as a plus i a plus b i instead of a comma b uh that's what you get from the distributive property so you reverse engineer that into this more streamlined definition of of multiplication that doesn't involve yes. assuming that you've got the square root of negative one and if if you had uh, i squared equals plus one instead of i squared equals minus one uh, you would get a different number system where the, multiple, the addition would be the same, but the multiplication, instead of AC minus BD, it would be AC plus BD. Yeah, 
And that would be, and those would be where I said like reels plus reels. Uh, that would yeah, be that yeah. number. That's right. Yeah. So, so w these are pairs of numbers. They're not, <laughs> not numbers. So what do we, why, why are we justified in calling these numbers? In the, in really, uh, I mean, I guess the modern, the modern um, answer to that would be that we call things numbers when they satisfy the properties of a number system in particular one property one one kind of number system is called a field um another kind is called a division ring that's what the quaternions are an example of a division ring and they're they're like a field without without one property so what are the properties of a field uh associativity of addition commutivity of addition uh and so forth Additive inverses exist. Multiplicative inverses always have to exist, and uh, and addition and uh, well, addition and multiplication are both associative and commutative, and that means you can group addition, pure addition, however you want. You can group pure multiplication, however you want, and um, you can change the order however you want. So, if you have a system like that, we call that a number system. You know. And in particular, that's a number system that has almost all the same properties of the real numbers, almost all. And, and where it says multiplicative inverses, uh, that's in case uh, the numbers uh, not equal zero. So right, for non-zero. Right. So, yeah, that's right. You and, can't. and then where I mentioned the division algebras. So the division algebras are all, um, they all maintain that property. And so, you, you know, like the octonians and stuff are kind of like a number system in the sense that it has that. Whereas like the Clifford algebras, when they're um, higher order, they they lose that property. And so in that sense, they kind of aren't a number system anymore. Yeah, I mean, at some point we, we lose things and then we start calling things division, you know, non-commutative division algebras mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then eventually rings. Almost everything is a ring. And is a ring a number system? I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. it's just that it loses a lot of properties. You know, you lose some essential properties of this. Um, and it turns out that once you get up to rings, almost everything is a ring. You know, and in fact, rings are probably the central idea of abstract algebra, right? I mean, it's probably the most rich mm -hmm. system. So a, a ring, yeah. a ring is a system that has addition and multiplication. It has both operations. And addition is commutative, and and mm -hmm. additive inverses exist. But multiplication need not be commutative. Multiplicative inverses need not exist. And mm -hmm. uh, it is associative, though. So you have almost everything. So, for example, the integers are a ring. You don't have uh, multiplicative inverses, but that is a commutative ring. Matrices, on the other hand are not commutative ring so and in fact they're sort of the generic so in a sense the biggest number system that's of interest in abstract algebra are matrices in finite dimensions anyway so according to that then we could call a matrix a number oh yeah yeah in fact we're going to in a second okay. <laughs> yeah we're going to yeah yeah um this is so, uh, Kirby's Kirby's uh, expert on namespaces in different fields. Uh, so, yeah, no, I mean uh, it's it's really uh, I mean these names are really important in mathematical notation and, and and names unfortunately are not the greatest. They're not the greatest. I mean they 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 like for example imaginary number not the greatest name for it. We'll talk about that later. Um, complex number is not a good name either. Um, Okay, so complex numbers, what's the additive identity? It's just zero, zero. What's the multiplicative identity? It's just one, zero. The additive inverse of A, B is just negative A, negative B. And the multiplicative inverse of A, comma, B, as long as one, at least A or B is not zero, is this right here. You can prove using that funny multiplication I defined that all these objects here on the right satisfy all the axioms that we just mentioned. Okay. So, Maybe just to jump in. Uh, so like when we're talking in the more general sense, it rings like it even could be rings and matrices or whatever. Because you have addition and multiplication, you need a zero for addition 
and you need an identity for multiplication, which be one. So a ring always has something that's like a zero for addition and something like a one for multiplication. Right. And so like you have here. Yeah. So here's the one and here's the zero. Okay. And you can think of this, the real part and the imaginary part. And for, of course, we're about to start doing that. So here's shorthand notation. Oh, I guess this is kind of where we ended, where we end last time. So let, let me just date this. So this is uh, continuing. This is uh, 929. Okay, so shorthand notation, instead of writing one comma zero, we just simply write one. And instead of zero comma one, we simply write I. And A comma zero would be written as just A. And B, zero comma B would be written as B times I. And A comma B would be written as A plus B times I. Just shorthand notation. We're not, we're not pulling any. We're not, and and where a is a real number and b is a real number. So we're just saying that you know instead of writing these tedious ordered pairs, we're going to write things that way. And what is i squared equal to? Let's go ahead and compute that. That's what does i mean? It means zero one, and then times zero one, and then we have to use our magic definition. What was our definition again? Maybe I should, let me copy this down. Yeah, I'm not so sure that's gonna be. Okay, so let me let me not copy it down. Let me, uh, let me just look at it for a second and we will just uh, kind of get our minds around it. You multiply A times C minus B times Z, A times D plus B times C. So AC, So A times C is zero times zero minus B times D, that's zero times one. I mean, time, let's see, minus zero. It's minus one, yeah. No, it'd be minus one. No, no, let's see. Minus B times Z is minus one, yeah. Okay, A times, yeah. And then, and then B times D is not, That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Okay. And then plus a times. Well, it would be a comma. It would be a comma. Zero, zero times one, which is zero. And then one times zero is b times c. That's plus zero. So this whole thing is negative one. Oh. Well, maybe write, maybe oh, use no, the let, let me write it as an order pair. I'm sorry. Let me write it as an order pair. Yeah. Okay, this is negative one, zero. And what is what does that mean? According to this little vocabulary here, we write it like this. We write it like, just simply shorthand that as negative one. Okay, so. So what, what that's saying is like when you have a I times I, I will be this saying that there's a one in the second part of each pair. And then it's saying that when you multiply those pairs together, that you multiply the front ones and the back ones, and the back ones get a minus sign. So the front one, zero times zero is zero. The back ones are one times one, but that'll give a minus one, but it's in the first half. And then, then the middle terms, zero times zero, I'm sorry, zero times one and one times zero, that will be um, in the second half. Yeah, so you get minus one. So I squared is equal to negative one by construction, mm -hmm. not by caveat, not saying that, you know, there's exists a number. We're just saying that that's the way these ordered pairs work out, this crazy multiplication. And you can then... By the multiplication rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you know, thus, and you can later, you can go on to prove, et cetera, that the complex numbers are consistent. I'm going to take a little sidebar here. Um, I 
you know, add add a page here um, because uh, we were talking about matrices and quaternions and and just kind of a little segue into that before we continue. Mm -hmm. um, so here's an alternative way. You know, when you define the complex numbers this way, you've got a lot of work to do. You have to prove all these axioms. And so, you know, it's tedious. I mean, it's many, many pages of, of, of tedium, uh, making sure that you, you know, cross your T's and dot your I's with regard to all these axioms. But there's another way of defining the complex numbers where all these things come for free. And here's how we define it. Here's another approach. Complex numbers are all matrices of the form A, B, negative B, A. They're all two by two matrices where A and B are real numbers. So complex numbers are really just a subset of the set of matrices, two by two matrices. Now, why is this the case? Now, for example, we're gonna associate uh, the matrix one, zero, zero, one, with the number one. We're just gonna call that one. And we're gonna call, for example, zero, one, negative one, zero. We're gonna call that I, just shorthand notation, et cetera, like we did above. Let's go ahead and compute I squared. Now we don't need like a new definition of multiplication. It's just matrix multiplication. So if you already believe that matrices uh, have all the properties that they do uh, at, at you know uh, at, you know uh, addition is commutative and multiplication is associative you know you know what how to multiply two matrices uh, then we can multiply these together And how do we do matrix multiplication? First row match up with first column gives us a negative one. First row match up with second column gives us a zero. Second row match up with first column gives us a zero. Second row match up with second column gives us a negative one. And this is just in shorthand notation for the for negative one. Uh, just a quick question: uh, Who's familiar with? matrix multiplication like for two by two matrices kirby are you ryan are you familiar ryan do you know how to a little bit and bill probably not or we'll we'll do a no. tutorial someday on yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll do a tutorial someday on matrices yeah sure so given you know given <laughs> if you if you believe in matrices then you got to believe in complex numbers because this subset of matrices has all the properties that you want for complex numbers. In fact, it is a field. And, and something that we can do in the future maybe is like, I, I would show you like, if you have two matrices of that form and you add them, they will stay in that form. The result will still be in that form. If you have two matrices of that form and you multiply them, they yeah. will also stay in that form. So, uh, it's that's called closed. That's right. That the complex it, that it's closed under multiplication. It's closed under addition. So yeah. someday we'll yeah. have a tutorial. We'll go to yeah. show stuff. Yeah, like you don't go outside the system by by means of the normal matrix operation. So it is a closed system, mm -hmm. and it's got this nice property. It's got this weird matrix I that squares to the negative of the identity matrix, negative one. Now this may be a little abstract for you, but the nice thing about it is that you get all these field axioms for free, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them for free. So you don't have to go through this tedious proof of proving every single one of them. Um, but the other thing is, it's a segue into quaternions. Um, this is a, these are two 
you know, these are two of our quaternions. All you got to do is add two more and you've got the full quaternion system. So it's a nice way mm -hmm. of extending toward quaternions. So if you like quaternions, we made the first two steps in building the quaternions here. So when when, uh, when Jerry has time later, maybe in, in a future month, he's into the quaternions and these two by two matrix, that's where I'll be able to maybe teach yeah. that. That's a, that's a right. nice and, segment. And later we're going to talk about this a, a little bit in terms of the geometry of this is that um, the complex numbers uh, have a natural geometric um, interpretation in terms of action on a plane, uh, on, mm -hmm. on a, points on a plane. And the quaternions have a natural geometric interpretation in terms of rotations in three dimensions. So complex numbers are sort of intimately related to rotations in two dimensions. We'll talk about that in a bit. And uh, quaternions are intimately related with rotations in three dimensions. So there's a, a very nice um, kind of a, a consolidated geometric way of understanding this whole progression of reals to complexes to quaternions. Anyway, let's go back. How do we visualize the complex numbers? Unless there's any questions. Okay. So complex, so real numbers just exist on a line. And a real number system is really complicated, right? It's got all these really crazy irrational numbers in it. Uh, yet they all kind of line up. It's a totally ordered system. And so we can visualize it quite easily. You know, it seems to be complicated, but when you look at it geometrically, when you look at it uh, with a number line, it it seems quite natural. Now, what about the complex numbers? This is all order pairs. A, B. Now, there's a addition and multiplication of these ordered pairs, but just thinking about them in terms of ordered pairs without thinking about the algebraic aspect of the complex number, order pairs just exist on a in a plane. There's the order pair A comma B. So this is just the old Cartesian coordinate system. So this corresponds to the complex number A plus IB. And so where's the complex number just one? Where's the, it's just right here. That's our, at multiplicative identity, whereas I is just straight up. Oh, by the way, we call this the real axis and the imaginary axis. So the real um, coordinate is graphed horizontally. The comp the imaginary coordinate is graphed vertically. And so I is just right here. So maybe it's a little more complicated than the real numbers, but at least there's a, a nice visualization of it. Instead of a one-dimensional system, it's a two-dimensional system that can be thought of as points in a plane. And so more than that, there's two ways of representing a complex number, you know, in terms of standard rectangular representation, but also polar. You can think of uh, a number, you know, a, a point in the plane being, being, uh, defined by how far that point is from the origin, that's the radius out to that point, and what is the angle that the ray between the origin and that point makes with the real axis, the horizontal axis, and that's our angle theta. So you can think of a complex number as being, being given by an R and a theta. So what does addition look like on the complex plane? So addition in the complex plane, if you've ever seen vector addition, it works like this. You just, uh, here's a, one complex number, here's another complex number. What you do is just complete the parallelogram started by those two sides. And then you draw the diagonal of the parallelogram and that points to this diagonal, uh, this this vertex of the parallelogram here, and that's just z1 plus z2. 
So you can think of it as what's called vector addition. If you're familiar with vectors. Another way of thinking about that is, you know, think of going along this complex number and then putting this arrow here to Z2, its tail on the tip of Z1, and that takes you out to a new place in space, and that's that that vertex there, and that's Z1 plus Z2. So it's almost like following Z1 and then following Z2. I was thinking about them as just arrows or vectors. And, and that's a geometric version of just adding the coordinates, like oh. algebraically. That's right. You're just adding the coordinates. Yeah. So what is multiplication? What's the interpretation of that? It it's maybe even easier to understand. All you do, you have to think of polar represent, re, polar representation. And all you do is you add the angles. You add theta 1 and theta 2. And so you're going to get a ray going this way, where its angle is theta 1 plus theta 2. Let's see if I can, I'm not sure I can fit that in, but that angle there is theta 1 plus theta 2. And you multiply the two radii, the two r's. And so you get a new complex number here. This is z1 times z2. You add angles, and you multiply magnitudes. The r is called the magnitude or mod modulus. So it's not much more complicated than real number multiplication. You have to multiply the magnitudes just like you would with real numbers, but then you add the angles. And that gets you out to a new place in the complex plane, and that's the that's z1 times z2. So there's a geometric interpretation of both. And I'm doing, you know, the reason why I like to emphasize this is that complex numbers are very concrete, you know. These are very concrete geometric manipulations and you know when you think about the reality of the complex numbers do they exist or do they not algebraically that may not be that convincing that there's a reality to the complex numbers it's just some sort of made-up system but to me if you can visualize something it it makes it all the realer and you can visualize addition you can visualize multiplication so to me it was an important step and for me when i when I realized all this like years ago that uh, of accepting the reality of the complex numbers and realizing that they're not so complex after all. I mean, the addition and multiplication are actually very simple geometric operations. And, and multiplication is even uh, more intuitive if you just uh, have numbers that are uh, whose length is one, let's say. So they're on yeah, the unit yeah. circle. And so like one is on the unit circle, I is on the unit circle, negative I, negative one, those are all on the unit circle, but there's lots of points on the unit circle. And so then their magnitude doesn't change. They're just, uh, the angle changes. And the angle yeah. changes, like you said, by rotating. It's just um, so, multiplying yeah, them, it's just adding rotations. Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, so I is right here. Here's I. And how, what's I times I? Well, what's this angle, 90 degrees? And so I times I, you just add the angles together and you're going to get 180 degrees. And here's I times I, and that's just negative one. Mm -hmm. So that's a geometric and, description of why I times and, I is negative one. And if you keep, you can keep going. So like I cubed will be um, negative I. And i to the fourth will be positive one, and That's i to right. the fifth will be back to i. You know, just keep going round and round and round. That's right. That's how you can see that cycle happens when you just keep multiplying by i. You just keep going around, around the circle. Um, in fact, we're going to talk about that in a bit. That's a really important aspect of complex numbers. In fact, I think it's the most interesting thing about complex numbers is that when you multiply a complex number by itself, you go, well, if the magnitude is one, you go in a circle. If the magnitude is not one, you go in a spiral. And, and philosophically, there's something to it where like when you multiply by I, you're swapping the axis. So like you shift from the 
x-axis to the y-axis. And so that's somehow like important thing that complex numbers are doing. It's like they're relating two different axes. Um, and that happens by that multiplication. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, okay. So let's talk about what they're used for. Um, so they're needed for certain computations like Cardano's. And it turns out that every polynomial equation of degree n has exactly n zeros, n solutions in the complex plane. You have to count multiplicity, something called multiplicity. But so that means that, for example, this polynomial has two zeros. It has two numbers that are going to make it zero in the complex plane. What are they? What are they, John? I wrote it down somewhere. Um, oh, they're one and two. Here they are. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this has uh, a zero multiplicity two in the complex plane because you can write this. I mean, this is x minus two times x minus one. This is x minus one squared. So you can see that you've got a double zero at one. But what about uh, what about this? So this has four zeros in the complex plane. Crazy looking polynomial, fourth degree polynomial. It's got four numbers that make it zero. It's got negative two and two, but then it's got two complex ones. So nice going Gauss. If this had been the only thing Gauss had ever done, it would have been impressive, but it's just one of the dozens maybe hundreds of things that gauss did that were kind of on that level he was a pretty impressive contributor to mathematics um so here's let me talk about authentic applications these are you know of interest to me and i think that this to me it kind of captures why complex numbers are so useful in so many applications that they are natural models of periodic phenomena, anything that repeats itself, like vibrations, waves, orbits, seasons, cyclical behavior, anything that kind of doubles back on itself and just keeps on repeating. Um, and so why is that the case? Uh, so if you look at real numbers and you ask, you know, if you apply like the same operation on real numbers, like for example, addition, like if you have one and you keep adding it to itself, it just marches off to infinity. One, two, three, just keep on adding one. That's not a cycle. In fact, you can't get a cycle in the real numbers by means of addition. If you add a number to itself, it'll just keep moving in that same direction off to infinity, either in a positive or negative direction. Now there's only one natural cycle by means of multiplication you can have one and negative one and just so start with negative one multiply by itself you go to one and then multiply by negative one again you go to negative one and then you just repeat that cycle so there's a two cycle big whoop right pretty disappointing those are real numbers now what if, what if you have uh like negative two. Well, if you multiply negative two by itself, you get four and four by negative two takes you to negative eight. So yeah, you do slosh back and forth, but you don't repeat, you don't double back on yourself. On the other hand, the complex numbers have lots of natural cycles. For example, here's a natural cycle in the complex number. Start with a 30, start with a, uh, a complex number that is uh, 30 degrees uh, from the real axis and one unit. Now, there's a couple different ways of, of representing that. You can represent it in polar form or you can represent it in Cartesian form, A plus IV form. And if you just apply the, the rules of multiplying, well, it's easier seeing it in polar form. If I
if I take this number and multiply it by itself, I'm going to multiply one times one, the magnitudes. So I'll get one. And then I'll add the angles. 30 plus 30 gives me 60. So I'll end up here. And then multiply by itself again. I'll multiply the one times one and I'll add the 30 and 60 and I'll end up at 90 degrees. It looks like 900, but it's 90 degrees. And so forth. And I'll just keep on going. So I, I'll go up to here. And then I'll go up to here. And then I'll go to here. And then to here, then to here, then to here, then to here. Keep on adding 30 degrees every time. And we end up back where we started. In this case, after, after multiplying in Z by itself 12 times, I finally get back to zero. So Z to the 13th is going to repeat. It's equal to Z. So there's a cycle in the complex numbers. And in fact, any, any, um, you know, any rational multiple, <clears throat> any rational angle at all <clears throat> is going to, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to repeat itself. Now, so this is an example of, of, of one of infinitely many phenomena in the complex numbers where if you choose a certain complex number on the unit circle and start multiplying it by itself, it'll just circle back on itself. So there's lots of natural cycles on the complex number. And so that gives rise to applications in the complex numbers um, for modeling wave phenomena. In particular, if you look at um visualization of a complex way where you take a complex number and you just you just raise it to any power you want including a real number it will cycle back on itself and it looks kind of like this if your t variable is along the horizontal axis and the complex variable is in this plane over here you get this kind of three-dimensional representation of this moving wave that looks kind of like this. I'll attempt to... So in the complex plane, you're just going around and around and around, but splayed out in time, what's happening is you're kind of going like this. So if you think of time as a geometric axis and the complex plane as a two-dimensional plane, you end up getting this kind of spiral phenomenon of a wave. And that's, and if you project that down into two dimensions and look at only say the real part, you'll end up getting just this two-dimensional sinusoid, which is normally how we think of, you know, the representation of waves when we're first learning, you know, wave phenomenon. So this gives you, this is a complex representation of the wave. If you look at its real part, you get a, a real wave. You have to use cosine function. And I, you know, I, this, this lecture, I, you know, we can't go into the detail of how that mathematics works, but you know, if you want to later, we can talk about the details of that. And so, but what's really happening, you know, if in a wave, you know, I mean, we can think of it in terms of the projection here onto the real axis or the complex axis. But a much healthier way of thinking about a wave is in terms of the complex plane, like a spiral moving through space. We call this like a phaser representation where you're looking at the real and imaginary parts simultaneously. So let me just show you, um, you know, I know that we're not, covering the details, but let me just show you the difference between trying to represent waves this way and trying to represent waves this way, which I'm saying is more organic, more wholesome, simpler. Um, when you try to add two waves, which you often do, because um, combinations of waves, of sinusoidal waves, create any kind of wave at all. 
any waveform is built up from basic sinusoids. So, you, so add two sinusoids, which are these, given by these cosine or sine functions. And you have to work really hard to come up. You have to work really hard to come up with a nice expression for the sum of two waves, the superposition of two waves. You can do it, and you can rewrite it in terms of another kind of sinusoid. But the amplitude gets very complicated, and the phase shift gets very complicated. So you can think of complex numbers in terms of, oh, just combinations of real and imaginary numbers. And it's just really just two numbers. But the complex number is sort of this, this unnatural thing. It's really the real number systems that's a natural thing. I'm hoping that this computation and comparing these two things I'm about to do convinces you that there's something natural about complex numbers. Because if you add two real waves, it's an absolute trigonometric mass. And of course, in undergraduate physics, you know, you don't talk about complex numbers to begin with. And this is what you have to do to add two waves. Later on in physics, upper division, maybe graduate level, you don't do that. So what do you do? You just say, well, I'm adding two complex waves. That's what they really, you know, that's, you know, that's another way to model waves just with complex numbers. And what is adding them together entail? Just add their amplitudes. The sum is just the sum of the two amplitudes multiplied by z to the t. It's that simple. So all this mathematics gets replaced by this. As long as you're willing to accept this picture rather than this. So it is a leap, you know, it is a bit of a leap up. You have to go up one dimension to talk about the complex numbers. But what do you reap when you talk about the complex numbers? Incredible algebraic simplicity. A question, John. Uh, what happened to the deltas on the right-hand side? Uh, yeah, so I'm. that's embedded in the Z. Oh, okay, it's embedded in the so Z. I, so it would be... So, so Z naught, I mean, yeah, if you want to really see it, it's Z naught. Um, is equal to e to the um, i, and then there's a phase shift. There's a you know complex number there, and you're raising that mm -hmm. to the t power. And then there actually might be another phase shift here. And I'm sorry. Oh no no I'm sorry. No no the frequency is embedded in the z naught. The deltas are embedded in the a's. Sorry about okay. that. Okay, they become part of the amplitudes. They become part of the amplitude. Yeah. Okay. Now you can go from here to here quite easily using the rules for decomposing complex numbers into the real and imaginary mm -hmm. parts. Um, but once you get used to this world on the right hand side and this picture here, you never go back. And and so unless, one way unless unless the real part or imaginary part is of interest, but you hardly ever do computations this way um, once you learn how to do them this way because it's just so much simpler dealing with complex numbers rather than rather than the real and imaginary parts separately. Yes, Andrews? Yes, yeah, so I, I, maybe one way to say, uh, to think about it is that like with the reals, you have to do the dimensions separately and you have like two equations. You have, you know, cosine and sine. You have to... Uh, link them, and so you have all this trigonometric machinery that has to be like in sync between them. Whereas, like in the complex point of view, it all gets uh, using the exponential; it all gets combined uh, automatically. You don't have yeah. to keep track of all that. That's right. And so it's, yeah, the real, it's yeah, doing the real and imaginary like, parts are live in harmonious live in a harmonious world where they can combine naturally. Where over here, you have to force it. And so the complex numbers are naturally relating two different axes, you know, by having this multiplication by I, they naturally have a notion of rotation, whereas the real numbers don't have that notion. So you have to kind of construct all this machinery that would basically simulate rotations. And that machinery mm -hmm. means you have to have double equations, you have to have right. trigonometric yeah. functions of two different kinds, they have to be in sync. 
And so that's the whole uh, right. You have to have two coupled real equations is one complex equation. And the coupling comes so naturally in, in the complex case because it's it's uh well and I mean I so, you can say about what what why it is natural, but I mean to me it's just sort of the observation that that you know complex at uh, magnitudes mm -hmm. add in a much mm -hmm. easier way than real magnitudes because the coupling is already taken into account by the way complex arithmetic works. Um, and philosophically, uh, there's an issue of slack. Like, how do you model slack? So in a lot of this periodic behavior, things are shifting the load between two different dimensions. You know, like one dimension becomes more important, the other dimension becomes less, but there's a slack between them. And so complex numbers are important, probably like in trying to model that slack that you get in periodic behavior. That's something to be looking out for. How are we all? I know this yeah. is a long lecture so far. Yeah, yeah. I made it no, I think, I, this is all, you know, this is pretty much what I wanted to do. I mean, I was talking, mm -hmm. I, you know, complex numbers. I was going to mention that they come in modeling electric circuits. You mm -hmm. model electric circuits with something called a transfer function. And that transfer function has, you analyze it. Uh, it's it's a polynomial and it's got, it's got um, zeros in the complex. <clears throat> zeros and poles in the complex plane and, and those tell you about the behavior of the they, they they give you clues to the behavior of this electronic circuit in fact they're everything you need to know to know how this circuit is going to behave so electrical engineers use it uh, we can you know they in 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 linear systems modeling and uh, finite systems finite you know difference equation systems the complex eigenvalues tell you about the periods the periodic uh, a path, you know, the, the paths that are going to be periodic in a in a transition diagram like that. And finally, um, I just wanted to conclude by saying that I think that this is terrible mathematical terminology, imaginary numbers, complex numbers. Um, this this has a very biasing effect on people and the way they think about things, and. Um, it should have never been called out. Mm -hmm. And what, what is a better name for these numbers? I would call these numbers, if I were a king of mathematics, I would call these the, the linear numbers because they are on mm. a line. And I would call these the planar numbers. It's a much, oh. it's a much more neutral way of talking about them. And it's much, mm -hmm. and it, it's actually suggestive of the actual geometric interpretation of these numbers. Um, there would be a lot less brain damage done by those two uh, terms rather than real and, and so the, in the imaginary numbers, you would call them like orthogonal numbers or what would you call them? Uh, um, I guess I would call those, yeah, let's see, what did, uh, what does Gauss say? Uh, direct inverse lateral units, that's what Gauss would have called them. So look yeah. at this, look at this, uh, this, I'll read this um, quote by Gauss from 1831. He said, if one formally contemplated the subject from a false point of view and therefore found a mysterious darkness, there is in large part, this is in large part attributable to clumsy terminology. Had one not called plus one, minus one, square root of negative one, positive negative or imaginary, or even impossible, which some people I guess called, units, but instead direct inverse and lateral, there, then there could scarcely have been talk of such darkness. Mm -hmm. And that's from like one of the one of the greatest contributors of mathematics ever, you know. And um, yeah, it's just, you know, I still hear engineers and physicists say, well, you know, we have to look at the real and imaginary parts because you know, after all, a complex is not a real. That's not a real thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and like hell, it's not real. Like when a when a wave comes into a communication system, you have to decompose it in terms of its complex coordinates. It's got a phase, and it's got it's got a magnitude and a phase, and 
there's ways of doing it where you you sample the wave to get the real and imaginary parts from it. It is, I mean, I think waves are inherently complex. That's my way of mm -hmm. thinking about it. I think that this picture is no more real or imaginary than this picture. And this picture is much more wholesome because it leads to much simpler mathematics. And, and it's much realer. It tells you the link between the real and imaginary parts. And so I think waves are inherently complex. Um, that's just my way of thinking. You know, uh, once I once you get a, a modeling system that makes things much simpler, to me, that tells you that you're homing in on something intrinsic about that system. So I think something intrinsic about waves is that they're complex. All this stuff in real can be done, but it's it makes it much more complicated. It's not natural. So anyway, that's my two cents. So I, I think that's the end of what I wanted to share. Um, we'll make these notes available. And I don't know, are there any questions, any comments? I'm, I'm kind of struck by how I, I'm, I buy into the, did you call it a phaser? Because that's cool, but a spiral, right? But then when we look at actual treatments of electromagnetic waves, we are always told it's not, don't, don't see it as a spiral because it's two perpendicular sine waves, the electro and the magnetic, right? Oh, uh, so well, no, they're, they're two orthogonal complex waves. Okay, so you look yeah. at each one separately. Yeah. Neither one's a spiral, so you don't get the spiral. Well, it, it, I mean, if you have if you have uh, circular polarization, it is it is a spiral, and the in the and the electric and magnetic fields are spiraling together. And are they, they spiraling they, together? They are. Yeah, they're spiraling in space together. Yeah. Because they're usually shown as just orthogonal to one another. Uh, that's that's in a snapshot of time, like a. So. Yeah, so this is a okay. Uh, I, I see what you're pointing out is like you know is the is the is the um, okay. So in space, the magnetic field and the electric field actually are are three dimensional vectors that have three real components to them. And if you take a snapshot in time, they actually point a certain direction in space, and and in a in a moving uh, electromagnetic wave, one is perpendicular to the other. This is true. Um, but what is the deeper mathematical model of those waves? That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about you know how you interpret the actual three dimensional uh, physics there. I'm talking about what is the model, the mathematical model for those waves traveling through space, and. I'm saying that each uh, each component in the x, y, and z direction is easiest modeled by a phasor representation rather than a real representation. The mathematics is much simpler. And um, so, so, um, and then, you know, there's another way of representing electromagnetic waves. If you want to represent them, you can write them as E plus I times B. And you get actually a consolidation of Maxwell's equations. Now, that's not usually the way it's done. The way you consolidate Maxwell's equations is via electromagnetic tensor. You actually write it as a, as a matrix. Uh, I think a four by four matrix. And so, I mean, what is... What is the deep structure of electromagnetism? I mean, that's probably more that more getting toward the deep structure is that electromagnetic field is really not two fields. I mean, you, you can interpret it in terms of particular experiments as two fields that point perpendicular to one another, but the deeper mathematical structure is this electromagnetic tensor, which is this four by four matrix. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about like, can you, you know, you can't, you know, you, you can always do experiments that that boil things down to some direction in three dimensional space and some magnitude along that direction. So you can always decompose things in terms of real numbers. 
But if you want to model things from a very compact mathematical point of view, you know, in a in a way that captures sort of the 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 essential essence of that of that object, you're. I'm interested in um, you know textbook you're, visualizations like pictures that go with the equations and so on, and you know you're talking to a graphic artist and saying this would be another way to communicate pictorially what's going on in the math and then and then you're saying maybe that there are ways that you could nudge it towards more spirals in your pictorial presentation that would actually so. be helpful yeah i think so yeah i think like so. i'm always frustrated you know, you know but kirby we're limited in dimensions so we have three dimensions we gotta we gotta cram things into three dimensions so we often look at projections uh true of, true but you can always draw a spiral or a screw I mean, there's a lots of phenomena that w that are definitely spirals, and if there's some way, just by analogy, you're not saying it does look this way. You're just saying, here's another way to think about it. I like your phaser approach. I'm it's always frustrated by those pictures of the gravitational field. People think it's very clever to say, oh, it's like a funnel. You know, a planet or star is this deep well, and I just roll this ball, and it goes around in an orbit. And they do that in museums, they do that in textbooks, yeah. they do that everywhere. But I think it's akin to what you're saying about unfortunate naming and things getting complex when you simplify it in an unfortunate way. Because really, my attraction to planet Earth should not depend on me being in any particular plane vis-a-vis -vis the Earth. So this picture of a funnel with a ball going around and around in a circle that becomes totally ingrained in people's mind as to how to visualize a gravitational field. But to me, it seems like an enormous dumbing down because it doesn't accommodate, you know, orbits in all angles, right? You know what yeah. I'm saying? Well, true, but on the other hand, maybe it gives you some essence of, of the way it works. These I'm sure it does, but at some point one should stop being proud of those things. Like the science museums always have that. Yeah. And it's like, let's have something else in addition, not like replace it. <laughs> But show us yeah. a different visualization, for God's sake. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I see what you're saying. Um, it's, yeah, I I think, you know, these, um, it, it, you know, one of the problems with complex numbers is that, you know, to, to visualize them and to visualize a complex wave, you do have to use three dimensions. You can't. You can't draw it very successfully in a on a in a two dimensional place, you know, and so which is why you know we draw sinusoids, we draw sines and cosines. Um, but I think these projections are actually helpful, but you then have to kind of take those projections and then kind of move up into the actual real sphere. You can get some insight from those projections, but the real deal requires kind of a more abstract visualization in higher dimensions. And, and so we learn from low dimensional cases, but then we have to we have to do some work to abstract to higher dimensions. And often that work is done by means of algebra or some kind of analysis, some kind of mathematical tool that brings us up. And then we sort of believe our pictures from low dimensions and then they're reflected in the mathematics of high dimensions. We feel like we have some intuition therefore, but, so I think those I think even people who do like four dimensional geometry and, and topology um, do think in terms of low dimensional models. You know, they just know that, oh, well, it's not going to fold back on itself that way. There's a higher dimension that, that's moving through. And then they learn to kind of kind of do that abstraction in in more abstract, quote unquote, vi quote unquote, visualization. Um, but I think the low dimensional stuff is still kind of in intrinsic to their thinking you know it's you know three-dimensional visualization i think is really important um but like you say it doesn't give you the full picture you have to you have to move up in terms of abstract thinking to get to higher dimensions plus now we have animation as much more accessible in terms of the technology mm -hmm. if you're looking at your physics textbook on a screen you can have all the cartoons you want in terms of moving things right Right, right. But we don't right. do that a lot. We stick to paper and we'll show the movie mm -hmm. somewhere else. It's like, right. why don't we teach physics exclusively on screens as opposed to textbooks? 
Why do you have to buy a big heavy textbook when it's already not the appropriate medium for learning physics? And, and virtual reality will probably could open up things, you know, that are, like, for example, like you mentioned with gravity or whatever, like where this idea that space becomes a different thickness, let's say, you know, I like that. That's no, something think... in virtual in virtual reality. You could you could maybe make that possible because it's not so much visual. It's more about how do things feel or how do things uh, behave? Uh, Ryan, what are your uh, impressions of this talk, or what did you what what struck you? I enjoyed the talk um, very much, and one part that struck me was uh, when John was doing his timeline, and there was this huge gap between Cardano and. Hold on, I got. You want me to show it? I'll show it. We can't hear you, Ryan. I don't know what happened. I don't. He may have to have done something. Sorry, I accidentally muted myself. I was thinking okay, Descartes was kind of a grifter. He just came in there and and gave I that name, you know, a hundred <laughs> or so years oh. later after Cardano's formula came out. Well, and I, also, I, I, I just wanted to add that uh, the Cartesian plane, I think Descartes came up with that. So the intuition Cardano had, like how do you do cubed roots of complex numbers, etc. He had to do it without the Cartesian plane, you know, which is very impressive what he must have been doing. Yeah. I interrupted yeah, you, Ryan. I don't Ryan. know. Yeah, I mean, that'd be an interesting history to look at. Um, and I imagine that, that Descartes, that was an ironic name to Descartes. In other words, I bet people didn't believe, you know, that there was a square root of negative one. And they said it's something, uh, I can just imagine someone saying that you're just making that up. And he said, okay, call it imaginary. I don't care, mm -hmm. you know, right. call it whatever yeah. you want, you know? And like, I, I just, I'd like to know, you know, why he called it imaginary. I think it was maybe based on being, you know, kind of ironic about people's rejection to it, you know? Well, I think he was an idealist in the sense, you know, like, so he thought that the inner world is more real, I think, than the material Maybe. world. So, Maybe. so see, for him, imaginary, it's not a knockdown. It's like, okay, like, let's just suppose yeah, okay. imagine. we imagine yeah. them, right? They're real in the sense. Yeah, I see. Yeah. That makes Bill, sense. what did you, what did you uh, find uh, meaningful, helpful? Well, I'm the groupie here, so uh, basically, I just followed as best I could. I enjoyed the whole presentation. I thought it was good pace, uh, it was very well spoken. I wasn't trying to learn something new here tonight. I was just basically following along. So, um, well done. That's all I have yeah, to say you. about it. Thanks. Thanks. This certainly helped with my intuition, especially, you know, the little visuals that you did uh, and okay. the spiral good. really yeah, helped good. me. Good. Oh, good. Yeah. And, and then, course, I, I'm just and thinking about complex numbers as matrices also. Sorry. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I think it's it, it, someone's interested in the quaternions and that's sort of a segue to get to get to the quaternions. It's kind of a natural way to of of uh talking about it and and uh I, so i want to do another one maybe between mm -hmm. you and you and me andres maybe we can just cope prepare it where we talk about how complex numbers are natural for rotation like when we, i was talking about spirals mm -hmm. we're really talking about rotation in a plane and quaternions naturally arise in rotations in, in three dimensions. So And so we could do that. And maybe the start would be like for me to give a tutorial on two by two matrices, right? So that oh, uh, everyone yeah. is, you know, Ryan, that would be good for you, right? And Bill, like to learn how two by two matrices work, because then uh, they have a lot of intuition to give, uh, like, you know, what does the rotation mean in two by two matrices? And, uh, I just want to be very grateful to John, uh, but also for you that like we're able to bridge these worlds. You know, John is a advanced mathematician of a uh, you know great caliber, and uh, your enthusiasts, groupies, or however you want to you know think educators, however you want to think of yourselves, 
uh, but that we can build these bridges. For math, for wisdom, it's very important um, uh, to be able to look fresh at these things. So like this idea that, hey, complex numbers may be more natural than real numbers by themselves. You know, that complex numbers are somehow entering the world of uh, real numbers. They have this generator that squares to negative one. Um, they're somewhere in the sweet spot in this number system. They can be thought of in terms of matrices. They can hook up different axes. Uh, they require a, 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 a us to develop an intuition. You know, they kind of challenge our values. And I think that uh, working together like we did today, um, it's not easy, but I think that it's, it really helps us build a new language um, mathematically and then maybe also philosophically, hopefully. Yeah. Can Does I ask a, a question I, real quick? Yeah. So uh, the one uh, cycle, the, the 12 cycle that you identified on the complex plane, how how was that identified? What was the technique? And do you know if there's a general strategy for identifying these? Well, any any uh, any rational angle like a 30 degrees or 10 degrees or, you know, three halves degrees or whatever, if you just keep on multiplying that complex number on the unit circle by itself, you will come back to itself eventually. And and my guess is that that was probably identified. Are, are you asking historically or how, how we how we uh, come up with those angles or I'm not, I'm not, I guess I don't fully understand the question. I can add something. No, I, I think you explained it pretty well. I was just. Uh, well, but I'll add things. something. Uh, it's it's a, one of the most beautiful things in math, but also very practical and relevant here. But if you've seen the formula E to the I theta equals cosine theta plus I sine theta, right? Have you ever seen that? That's called, I think, Euler's formula, right? Euler, yeah. Yeah, you see, that bridges those two worlds. So like uh, cosine theta and sine theta would give you the X and Y positions on a circle, okay? So if you do trigonometry, if like, like so I emphasizes that, oh, this will be on the Y axis. So when you put that I in there, all of a sudden it segregates the cosine and the, and the sine. It says, okay, cosine will be uh, referring to the X, you know, the real numbers. Sine will be referring to the imaginary axis. And they will give you like a um, X comma Y type of position. But you see, it turns out that E to the I theta is a shorthand where that angle theta, which could be 30 degrees or, you know, five degrees or whatever you want it to be. You see, it all gets focused on that angle theta. And so instead of having to deal with cosines and sines and two different real numbers, it all gets, and then, then you're just rotating, you know, e to the i theta. It could be e to the i 30 degrees, e to the i 60 degrees, e to the i 90 degrees, e to the i 120 degrees, you see. Right. And so it right. is, a, it is a, it's all focused, and you, have, you, you don't have to look at any of the um, calculational and the, and I think the other um, thing I would it all becomes, is that multiplication you, becomes rotation. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing. When you take a, a a complex number that's on the unit circle, and there was this distance from the origin is one, and take any any complex number on the unit circle, multiply by itself, it's going to rotate itself by it's going to double its angle. That's you know, in other words, when you multiply two complex numbers, you add the angles, multiply the magnitudes. If the magnitudes are one. The new magnitude is going to be one. So if you start off with like 15 degrees and you multiply, you know, a complex number is angle is 15 degrees and you multiply by itself, you'll get a complex number of magnitude one. And it's on the unit circle whose angle is now 30 degrees. Now multiply another 15 degrees, you've got 45 degrees. And then you'll just keep on adding the angle until you rotate back to where it was to begin with. That's what, that's geometrically what multiplication does so multiplication in complex numbers really kind of implements rotation geometrically rotation in the plane that's the thing it's intimately and, related and, and multiplication what it 
And so polar coordinates are very important uh, and maybe more natural than uh, X and Y coordinates. You know, if you think about like when once you start believing that complex numbers are more natural, then you realize like polar coordinates are more natural. And what they do is that they they say multiplication has two different issues that should be just disconnected. One issue is how much are you rotating? The other issue is what's happening to the magnitude, the size. And it turns out that they're disconnected. And complex numbers really emphasizes the disconnectedness of those two things. And so one of the things that you get, uh, you would need, you know, when you learn calculus, uh, when you study calculus, e to the x is basically a name for this uh, function, which equals its own derivative. So when you are uh, multiplying things, you have this exponential growth and e to the x will be the way to do exponential growth where it will uh, equal its own derivative. Well, when you do rotations, you have the same phenomenon except it's uh, e to the i x. And so e to the i x or e to the i theta will be what happens when the derivative equals the original function. And so when you look at things like cosine and sine and you study their derivatives, they're switching back and forth. Derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of cosine is minus sine. Derivative of minus sine is minus cosine. Derivative of minus cosine is sine, I think. And, and so they're going back and forth like that. Well, e to the i theta is capturing that. Uh, it's just saying you don't have to break it up into four different pieces. It it's all happens directly. So so it's mysterious, but, but somehow it building intuition and you know and learning from the history of math is helping to direct us like what to believe is natural it's a matter of belief you know what do we want to believe and to stop believing things that we've been assuming that oh x y is uh, you know i think this goes back to buckminster fuller you know like can you challenge this idea of the x y z coordinate system and to say hey like maybe that's not the natural thing the natural thing may be rotations you see so I think we can just, it, you know, though, given the history, how we had natural numbers and you count upwards and then we always mm -hmm. put that uh, X axis positive to the right, negative to the mm -hmm. left. No one breaks that convention, which is just arbitrary, of course. Yeah. But the thing is, the square root has a very natural meaning in the so-called linear numbers. You picture a number that's not as big as the number you're trying to get to you take the square root it's like you know there's all this intuition and then you're like telling people like kids like you're breaking the news say to third graders oh by the way we have a symmetrical flipped over system where we go in the negative direction i.e to the left but we have no concept of being able to do that kind of shorter arrow that multiplied by itself goes leftwards all your left pointing arrows multiplied by themselves are going to end up going to the right and I think we could just say, this is a terrible design. It's horrible asymmetry. No wonder we needed the complex numbers. This was primitive idiocy, really. We should diss the real numbers more. Hmm. Yeah, and so like an example of what you say, like if you think of rotations as basic, then you can look at, instead of talking about negative one, you could say, well, that's 180 degrees. And if you think of rotation as multiplication, you could say, well, what's the square root of 180 degrees? Well, it would be 90 degrees because you do 90 degrees twice. That gives you 180. Mm -hmm. So you see that minus one, it becomes obvious that, you know, and then also you realize, hey, 90 degrees is just one way to do it because negative 90 degrees is also going to work. And then you see that, you know, Clockwise and counterclockwise are equally valid. 90 degrees and negative 90 degrees, or like you can say I and negative I are equally valid. Who named one the one way? Who named it the other way? Like, you know, so we're inching, you know, to try to get some intuition on these things. And that's why these conversations, I think, are very valuable because they force us to rethink like, hey, like who came up with these terms? What is this all about? You know, that we need that. Um, so thank you for sticking with us. It's hard. Yeah. Um, to me, to me, it's a large part of it is familiarity. Like, uh, you know, the complex numbers. I know when I was first learning mathematics, you know, for some reason you don't, in the math curriculum, you don't really do much in terms of the complex numbers until you get farther into the curriculum. I think maybe complex analysis might have been the first place where I really uh, dug into them and 
uh, then you just start working with them and all of a sudden they just sort of become natural to you because of your experience with them. It, to me, math is very experiential. You know, I, I'm trying to learn SU2, for example. I'm trying to learn this new mm -hmm. area of math, you know, Lie algebras and Lie groups. And I'm just working. I'm just noodling with it, just just hours and hours. And it's starting to sink in. It's, it's sort of that activity of experience to me that that makes it natural you know uh it just somehow and, and some I think abstract, like, like some abstract overlay like i can see that i've learned that i've known that for a long time but now i'm getting up close and personal with the actual computations and to me that's that's what leads to um feeling like i kind of own it you know it, it's it, it becomes more part of me rather than this this uh thing that i take someone else's word for i think it, your, these... your whole demonstration of how to multiply two complex numbers by including adding the angles and all that. This comes up with the Mandelbrot set, right? It's like you pick a point on the well, complex mm -hmm. plane and you just keep multiplying by itself. And does it converge or diverge given, you know, where you started and you color code it depending on how quickly it converges or diverges. Or oh, you, oh. And it's like, that was an explosive thing in my you know, my tenure here on planet Earth, the, the Mandelbrot set suddenly appeared. Everyone had it on a T-shirt. It's exploded yeah, right. on my YouTube. That, yeah. But then when I look at the standard high school curriculum, which I do a lot, it's like they've missed this opportunity. They don't, they're not adaptable enough to say, you know, we could have brought fractals in right here and do the Mandelbrot set right. and nail the complex number concepts so much better. But instead, like you say, we're going to push that off into higher math in college, and we're just going to cut you loose in high school, and you'll never hear about the Mandelbrot set. And it's like, hmm. what a waste. What a waste. Yeah. And, and so what, one of the like the things that people like Gauss, you know, or what exactly did what, exactly what John is doing, you know, what I should be doing is lots and lots of calculations is how you build up your intuition. So like with the Mandelbrot set, like, you have to sit down and do calculations and say, hey, this one diverged, this one converged. That's when you start to really understand, wow, like this is funky, you know, this is weird. Uh, so it's not just the visualization, it's the calculation that really uh, allows you. And so there's lots of things that are not visual in terms like music, let's say, or let's say tying knots and untying knots. There's different things you need to have uh, based on practice. And so calculation is the mathematical version of, you know, building up experience, like in, into what are the patterns? What do they mean? How do they work? It's tiresome in a certain sense, but how to make that more enjoyable or more meaningful or more fun or more kind of like, uh, you know, I think that's a question. And so with these videos, we're trying to um, learn how to, you know, with your help and different people of different experience, trying to figure out like, how can we, figure out what we kind of intuition we should be building up and then what are good ways to build that up. So John mentioned SU2. That's a very uh, challenging thing. Complex numbers are a step towards that. Quaternions are a step towards that. Matrices are a step towards that. Yeah. Anyway, Any I, I, do, I, I think I've got to go. Um, yeah. So, so um, Kirby, could you give us a closing uh, benediction or prayer? No. Or just a, Please, Kirby. Well, in, in the Quakers, we just do a moment of silence. Mm -hmm. So I do five seconds of silence. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank good you. to be here. Yeah. Have a good day. Okay. We'll 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 publish the uh, Andres will publish the notes and the and the video. Yeah, we'll be back with more. Okay. Very good. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter of Math for Wisdom because it's very interesting platform i'm getting a lot out of my participation and i'm i'm interacting with interesting people there so i hope you sign up too